Never mind. <laughs> Luca, don't worry. No, I'm not worried. No, <laughs> I'm on YouTube, exactly. So thank you very much for all the setup and all the effort, Luca, for arranging all these talks. And th thanks to you for coming. So uh, I was supposed to give this talk last year in November, but uh, actually it's about Edmund Clark, who shared the Turing Award for model checking. But I postponed it. I don't know Edmund Clark personally. I never met him. so. I was a bit uh, hesitant and I was telling Luca, come on, I don't know Edmund Clark, but okay, I know model checking and model checking is cool. So I don't know Edmund Clark, maybe he's an interesting, cool person, maybe a boring one, but model checking is really cool. So, and I'm sure all of you can use the ideas um, in your fields of interest. And actually he did a very, good job in uh, promoting model, check, model checking, no matter what kind of personality he had. So Edmund Clark is a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, together with his previous PhD student, Alan Emerson and Joseph Sifakis, they got the 207 ACM Turing Award. Uh, Joseph uh, Clark and Emerson are from Carnegie Mellon and Joseph Sifak is, uh, is from France. So it was two independent work, um, both um, getting to the same results. So the award was for their role in developing model checking into a highly effective verification technology that is widely adopted in the hardware and software industries. So this is what they did. Uh, Clark was born in 1945 and uh, he got his BA and MA both in mathematics and his PhD in uh, computing science at Cornell University. And he actually, in his PhD, he made very deep connections between the mathematical logic and computing, and that's his achievement. And he was actually focused on this work from the beginning and up to now. Uh, he went back to Duke for two years for teaching, and he was a few years at, at Harvard University, and then he started at Carnegie Mellon in 1982. And this is actually the year that he, uh, uh, he published a paper for which he won the award. So correctness of computer systems, this is important for all of us. And uh, yeah, we all know that a faulty program can cause damage at least can waste our time, and uh, much worse than that can cause injury or loss of lives. So uh, Clark's career has actually focused on mathematical reasoning about computer systems, and the emphasis was on reasoning about the reliability of those systems. That's what, uh, that's what he did. He first started uh, on working on horse logic and how he can apply it uh, to programs and prove that the programs are correct. In his PhD, he found, he found some um, problems with some structures in programming languages uh, where he couldn't use her logic properly. And then uh, actually in 1980, 81, together with his student, um, they noticed that they can use temporal logic. Temporal logic was another kind of logic proposed by uh, Amir Pnueli actually to use in computer science, and Amir Pnueli also won a Turing Award. His work was presented in 1977, and he won an award before Clark and Emerson and Sifakis. So they noticed that temporal logic can be used to check the programs and it can be used for model checking by an algorithm. So instead of proving, instead of proving that the program is correct, and this is actually a quote from the paper of uh, 1981 of Clark and Emerson, that they're saying that the task of proof construction is in general quite tedious, and also it needs lots of expertise from uh, an expert uh, person in logic. So they argue that proof construction is unnecessary in case of finite state concurrent systems. 
and can be replaced by a model theoretic approach. So they uh, could actually build an algorithm, an efficient algorithm that uh, then they can use it to determine if the program meets its specification. Instead of sitting down and trying to prove that a program is correct and playing with logic, they could add actually by looking at temporal logic, they came up with this algorithm to just run the algorithm and prove that the um, program is correct. So this was uh, in parallel with the work by Joseph Sifakis and his collaborator. Uh, they were working in France, and uh, this is a quote from Clark paper on birth of model checking, uh, which is a quote from another person, Wolfgang Bollier. When the time is ripe for certain things, these things appear in different places in the manner of violets coming to light in early spring. So the technology of model checking was born in two places at the same time. So it was the idea was ripe. Many people were working on uh, correctness of programs, proving th theorems, and two independent groups came up with this idea of model checking. And they got the award in 2007. Edmund Clark, and this is Alan Emerson, and Joseph Sifakis. Actually, I have met both of these two guys. Uh, Joseph Sifakis, I met uh, more than once because he's also working on coordination languages. So. I listened to his lectures in more than one event talking about different things. But Edmund Clark, unfortunately, I never met. So they shared a credit. And uh, yeah, I was trying to find if there is any debate or anything because of this sharing, uh, looking for juicy stuff. But um, there was not much, actually. Uh, Clark is saying in his paper that their work was certainly independent of ours. So he's say, saying that the work of Sifakis was presented at a conference in 1982, and the technical report is there. And um, yeah, so it was independent. And I regard this as a case of essentially simultaneous discovery of an idea whose time was right. But then there is a footnote, where, which is uh, some kind of discussion on details, actually. I sent a draft of this paper to Sifakis. He replied that they had another paper in 1982 and 83 that included the until operator and could express a particular class of fairness property. So these are uh, some features that uh, apparently Clark and Emerson were supporting in their model checking, but it was not in Sifakis' work. But these are details. So however, this paper references our paper. And after 25 years, Sifakis was unable to explain how it differed from our first paper. So this is the only uh, debate that I could find out. Uh, I heard the stories, but OK, I don't know exactly what's going on, so I won't say anything. Uh, and this is the, the video that you have to uh, See from there and hear from here. It was the floating point division error in the uh, very first Pentium, the Pentium 1, uh, in 1994. Uh, Intel used an SRT division algorithm uh, for uh, uh, floating point division in the Pentium. And uh, there were five entries in the in a table that were, were missing and, and led to, uh, to, to this uh, error. Now, uh, hardware uh, bugs are, are particularly troublesome because quite frequently, you can't just send out a software patch. You actually have to replace the chip. And it's estimated to cost uh, Intel uh, 400 to $500 million uh, to uh, uh, to uh, fix uh, this uh, uh, problem. Uh, soon after Intel uh, made the, the announcement uh, that there was a, a real problem with the Pentium 1 uh, chip, uh, a, a former CMU student uh, who had taken one of my classes, uh, Manfred Kyra, and who was then working at Intel, called me up and said, send me one of your students. And I sent him uh, Zhudong Zhao, 
uh, who was my best student at the time, uh, Zhidong spent uh, uh, three or four months at, at Intel and was able to show that his thesis uh, topic, uh, word level model checking, uh, could uh, indeed have found the, the Pentium error. And moreover, he was able to show that the fix that Intel, had come, that Intel came up with uh, did indeed uh, fix the, uh, the problem. Now, um, unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for those of us in the verification uh, business, hardware errors continue uh, to occur. Uh, uh, just uh, last year, there was apparently uh, a, a, a problem with the uh, translation look aside buffer in an AMD uh, processor. Uh, it actually delayed the release date of the uh, uh, processor from what uh, I have been able to, uh, to learn. Uh, AMD didn't officially an announce this, so I have put two question marks here to indicate uh, uh, that this uh, is uh, a r a really a rumor. But if you Google AMD Barcelona bug, those of you who have your, your laptops with you, you can find plenty of discussion about this uh, particular problem. Model checking. Uh, the model checking is an automatic uh, verification technique. Uh, it's, it was originally developed uh, for reasoning about. Okay. So this is actually it's three minutes was three minutes of uh, his talk when he was uh, receiving his award, telling why model checking can be useful. Um, and now I will continue uh, instead of Clark. I will tell you what is model checking. And actually, as I wrote in my first slide, I'm using many of his slides in, in my uh, presentation. So what is model checking? It's an automatic verification technique. You give the specifications in propositional temporal logic. And then you have a procedure for exhaustive search of the state space of the design. So this is uh, what you're doing in model checking. And what are the advantages of model checking? This is the advantages comparing to like theorem proving. So there is no proof. It's algorithmic. It's fast if you compare it again with theorem proving. And you can have partial specification. You don't need to have a full uh, specification for uh, as the property of the behaviors. And maybe the main uh, advantage of model checking is that if it tells you that something is wrong, it can also give you the, the counterexample. So this is really important. Uh, when you are proving or even when you are testing, so you can also compare it with testing or simulation. When you are testing, uh, it's the tester doesn't give you immediately where is the, the problem, or especially if you are proving a theorem, you cannot see what's the uh, problem. But here you can track the problem. But what's the disadvantage? There is a trade-off like everything else. You will get into state explosion. So uh, come on, you have a big uh, program, lots of variables. When you have only a two-bit counter, you will have a state space with four states. And if you have n-bit counter, you will have two to the power of n states. This is state explosion, so you cannot handle it. That has been the challenge and the topic of research in model checking. So all this, this is what also Clark is saying in his uh, speech that, yeah, this has been his quest in the past 27 years, but now it's 33 years, to just to find solutions for state uh, explosion problem. And uh, so the problem that this model checker is solving is actually getting the model as the state transition graph and getting the specification as a temporal logic and then find out if this f is satisfied or not. And giving back you an answer of yes or no if uh, it's not satisfied together with the counterexample, the error trace. So uh, it's used like this. So you have the model of the software or the hardware description, and it will compile to the transition system. You have the informal specification. 
This part has to be manual, manually changed to the temporal logic formula. This can be a bit uh, actually complicated, but you can do it. And then you have the model checking tool here to uh, get these two as the model and the property and give you the answer. Uh, just a very simple example to see what's going on. So if you have a traffic light, just one traffic light, it's easy. You just model it. It's one variable with the value of green, uh, yellow, and red. So you move from green to yellow to red and to green. It's a simple kind of traffic light. It's not the Icelandic one. So um, then if you want to model two traffic lights and you want to stop people when this side is passing, this side has to stop. So now it becomes more complicated. You have to be careful that uh, not to allow both traffic lights to be green at the same time to actually to guarantee the safety of the crossing. And on the other hand, you don't want to keep one always waiting. So you don't want to keep one always red and the other one just passing by. So there are some properties that you want to satisfy. And what will happen here when you have two traffic lights, then you have this interleaving of changing of the states. So this in the right is one of the traffic lights and on the left is, is the other one. This one is green, this one is red, so it's uh, uh, the right one will change to yellow and then to red, state red. The other one, now the other one will finally change to green and then when the cars pass, this is some timing here, it will go from green to yellow and then to red and back here to the initial state. So this is when you when you're seeing two traffic lights, this is what you see. Uh, in principle, you will have two to, the, two to the power of three states because you have two lights and each can have three values, but you don't want all the states to happen. So actually, this is the states that you are excluding here. You don't want both to be green. Uh, and the other state, which is not here, is two yellow, which never happened. This is a very simple example of showing what's going on in model checking. So this is the behavior, this is the model and the behavior of the system, and this is the specification or the property, uh, and you want to prove that this one holds on this behavioral model, which is the transition system. So what you can do here, you can use temporal logic. That's why when Edmund Clark and uh, Emerson actually saw this temporal logic that they got excited, I assume, and uh, they thought, oh, this is really good because in this kind of system, you are not talking about one state. When I say a uh, sun is in the sky, I'm talking about this instance of time, the, the current state. But they didn't want to do that. They wanted to talk about all the states. They wanted to say that this thingy never can happen. This property can never happen. So this temporal logic helped them. This is talking about the traces, about the uh, traces of uh, the execution, about more than one state. So here, if when you say A is true now, you're talking only about this state. If you say, but temporal logic actually allows you to talk about the next state. So if you say XA, it means that A is true in the next state, meaning here. And if you say FA, it means that A will be true in the future. So this FA means finally or in the future. At some state, A will be true. So like you want to say this light one will be green at some point, finally, in the future. You're not talking about now. With propositional logic, you could only talk about the current state. And this one is telling you that A will be globally true in the future. So this is for all the states. This usually you use for safety. You want some property to uh, hold always globally in all the states. And um, it can, you know, you can negate the proposition and make it never. So the, the property that we wanted 
it should never happen that you have two lights green. You can actually specify that using this G of GA. Okay? And there is another operator until A will hold true until B becomes true. So like red, no, uh, the light will be green or yellow until it becomes red, something like that. So you have a property that needs to hold until the other one come by. So this is for until. So you are, now you have a powerful specification property language to show what you want to happen in your uh, transition system. So that was one way of looking at, at the time, just uh, traces, one trace, infinite traces of the states. This is another uh, view to time if you look at it in a branching way, actually. So you have the state transition here. You unwind the transition system. You look at the, uh, the traces in a tree, actually, the tree of the traces. So here you are in the yellow one. You can go to red or blue. You will show it here. You'll, uh, you are actually unwinding this. From red, you can go to yellow or blue again. If you are in blue, you are stuck. This is what will happen. You will see it in this tree. And uh, anyway, you are unwinding the state space. You are not doing anything else. And then you are talking about the traces that you can see in this tree. The language now is talking about, it's very similar to linear temporal logic. You can mix them, but uh, there are subtle differences between them. So this is, if you say EFA, it means there exists a path or a, A will possibly become true, which means there exists a path where finally A becomes true. So this is like this one. And then for AF is A will necessarily become true. So if you look at all the traces in the tree, then you should see A somewhere. So A will necessarily become true. This A is for all. The next previous one was the uh, there exists one. And this is the, actually the invariant or the safety property when you want to say that something holds all the time in all the states. Uh, this is EGA is a potential uh, invariant. So uh, in one of these traces, you always have this A holding. So this is how you uh, use CTL instead of LTL. And uh, these are the temporal operators that you have. We also have CTL star, which is very powerful and allows complex, complex nestings. But then the model checking algorithm would be difficult. Uh, actually, they um, proposed a linear model checking algorithm for checking CTL property. That was the nice thing about it. So now that you have seen, I showed you the example of the uh, traffic lights. This is a slightly more complicated one, not that much, but this is also from Clark's slide. So you have the microwave of an example and you you will have the, some events are happening. The events are actually on the transitions and uh, uh, the state of this micro oven will change and then you are saying this is the specification, this is the property that you want to hold. You are saying that the oven doesn't heat up until the door is closed. You don't want the oven to start heating when the door is open. That's dangerous. So this is the property that you want. So you're saying not heat up holds until door is closed, and you show it using your temporal logic like this. Not heat up until door closed. So you can do that. Uh, OK, back to the challenges. We have state explosion. So I'm just repeating myself again in many Actually, what Clark is doing now is using model checking for curing cancer. So this kind, this is something that can be applied on different models, different computational models and different behavioral models. This is what computer science, like we had a paper by Luca and Anna, just how we apply all this knowledge of computer and different uh, uh, different phenomena or different fields in science. So uh, you can see how can you relate it 
all these concepts to things that are not really programs. So, uh, I will tell you about state explosion because that's the problem. So, the moment you start, what was that? The moment you start um, to deal with real problems, you will get into state explosion. So as long as you're playing with your own toy examples, you're fine. Everything is fine. You can find the problem. But when the problem is big and large, you will get into problems of state explosion. And this is actually natural because we are dealing, if we are dealing with 10 megabytes of cache, we can have more than 10 to the power of 20 million states. That's not a joke. If you look at the number of atoms in the observable universe, it's much smaller than to the power of 69 to 81. So in the worst case, it's unavoidable, but actually this, I don't think we ever get to this number. But anyway, this is possible in the worst case. And uh, there have been actually steady progress over the past 33 years using clever algorithms, data structures, engineering methods, trying to uh, actually tackle it, this state explosion problem. These are some of the breakthroughs. Symbolic model checking, partial order reduction, compositional verification, bounded model checking, counterexample guided abstraction refinement. I will tell you about a few of them. What's bounded model checking? So, uh, Actually, here, first you are bragging about uh, exhaustive proof but uh, and searching all the states, but here you're bounding it, actually. So you just go up to some steps. And you can use uh, SAT solvers. People say these, these are the future of model checking, actually. I've heard that from many people, that um, these are actually... Uh, SAT solvers will prove that a logical formula is correct or not. So somehow we are back to proving the logical formulas. But now we have very fast SAT solvers and we have competitions to make them faster and faster. So what you do, you, you write your program or your model like a, a logical formula. This is the initial state. These are the transitions. Uh, from different states, like the variables in state 0 to state 1, and so on and so forth. But you can only just have a finite number of steps. It cannot be infinite. And then you have the property. You have, and you just have, um, uh, you, you put them in an AND in a logical formula, and you will check if it's satisfied or not. Um, yeah something I forgot. Anyway, so this is one way. The other way of just, so remember I'm reducing the state space. I'm tackling this state space explosion. This is another way to go partial order reduction. So if you have the states like this, so you have P and Q, so it's sunny and I'm happy, it's sunny and I'm not happy, it's not sunny and I'm happy, it's not sunny and I'm not happy. So, and you have this I and J transitions here, P and Q are atomic propositions. You are not interested in Q. You are not interested in if I'm happy or not. Q is irrelevant. You're just interested about P, if there is sun or not. So you just move away, abstract away proposition Q and see what you have here. So you, you, when you got rid of Q, actually you can get rid of all these states and transitions. And uh, usually when you have this kind of diamond state space, this is where partial order reduction works, and then you are reducing your state space. And of course, uh, this is only when you don't care about happiness of me. You don't care about Q, okay? You have, when you're abstracting the propositions away, you have to make sure that you are not interested in those, the properties depending on those propositions. And here, these uh, LTLX and CTL star X, they all preserve when you are applying partial order reduction. This is a nice one, this counterexample guided abstraction refinement. Uh, you have this predicate abstraction, which is similar to what I've told you. 
So you keep track of certain predicates and then get rid of the others. And you also use this counterexample to refine your abstraction to see if you have done the abstraction correctly or not. You use that. So what you will do here, you have your program, change it to transition system, and you have your informal specifications that are changed to temporal formula, and then you will find the, uh, the counterexample here. If there is a counterexample, you will find it and you will find the trace. This is what you have already seen. Okay, and then there is a kind of existential abstraction that you can apply on your model. Uh, so if you have a model like this, then if you can, actually, if they have the properties that uh, you can abstract them, like what I, sh I showed you, a very simple example. Uh, so here you just uh, wrap them all and see them as one state, and this one also, and this one also. So instead of a huge amount or heal, you have, I don't know, eight states, now you have only three. This is how you reduce the state. But you have to make sure that you are uh, putting the transitions correctly. So you add the transitions there. So this is abstraction. And then there is a theorem proving that some of the formulas, some of the properties are preserved here, like the other one. So the, the propositions about the sunny weather was preserved, but my happiness, you don't know anything about that anymore. OK. Here you may get into spurious behavior. So this is what you are doing. Like you have these three states, but you are abstracting and saying, come on, I don't care. I don't care if it is yellow or green. I just abstract it as a larger state of go. OK? So you abstract it. But you have to add the transition, the transition arrows there. And then you have just noticed that you, you're adding this transition here. Then this is the property you were checking, AGAF red. Every path necessarily leads back to red. But this is nasty. This transition here actually is giving you a spurious counterexample. You can stay in this state. So something is wrong. But OK, yeah, this is the artifact of the abstraction. Your abstraction things way and you miss the information which gives you a, a, a wrong, uh, actually, now you have a wrong answer here, a wrong counterexample. But what you can do and you want to do, you want to get to the best abstraction. So if your abstraction is too fine, if you don't abstract enough, you will get into state explosion. If it's too coarse, if you don't abstract enough, uh, yeah, sorry. If it's too coarse, actually, if you're abstracting too much, then you have loss of information, and you don't want that. So uh, what you are going to do is using this kind, kind of counterexample, spurious counterexample, to find out the best abstraction. OK? So you will, you will abstract. You will find the, uh, the counterexample. You will check if the counterexample is the right one or not. And then you will refine your abstraction if it's a wrong abstraction. So here you have your first abstraction. Then you, may, you have some refinement. You find a spurious counterexample. And for finding that this was not a right one, it was a spurious counterexample, you have to run the program or simulate the program itself. That's how you will find out. But that's now easy. You have the counterexample. You just trace it and see if the real program is going to get into problem or not. OK? So you still have your uh, program over there. So you will validate uh, this spurious counterexample. And you will get into validation or counterexample if this is a right one. Or if the program is fine, then the, uh, the abstraction was correct. You can stick to your abstraction. And you're fine. So this is the whole approach, which is called SIGAR. And this is what's in, uh, this is introduced in Sifakis group, actually. Uh, it was there before the AT even. So you have the C program. You have your abstract models with some kind of initial abstraction. You don't know if you are introducing any 
uh, problems or not, if you're abstracting too much or not. So you use your model checker, you do the verification. If there is no error, the property holds, you are fine. If there is a counterexample, you will check it. So you will feed it into a simulator and will find out if this is a spurious counterexample or a right counterexample. If it's successful, then the bug is found and you're fine. If it is not, you have to refine your abstraction. You have to add more detail. Okay? So this is what we have. Uh, this is the, the reduction techniques that I wanted to uh, talk about. Uh, challenges for future. Uh, we, uh, we're going to exploit this power of SATs and SMT solvers. As I told you, they are going to get uh, faster and faster. They are getting faster and faster all the time. Compositional model checking is one way. Uh, for every big problem, this divide and conquer is something that we always use. But compositional model checking didn't seem to work that well. So we, we couldn't really make it work that much. Uh, and there, there's still uh, work to be done to uh, use it properly. The other thing is software model checking. So what Clark, if, if you notice, he was talking about hardware model checking. And mostly they are working on hardware model checking. In hardware industry, model checking is really well established. So I have a friend who is rich in Berkeley by having a hardware model checking company. We in software are trying to convince people to accept model checking is useful, but people in hardware are earning money by model checking. So in, uh, it's um, not yet mature model checking of software. So we have to work on that. Um, and also verification of embedded systems when you have time and when you have hybrid, uh, like continuous behavior. All these states are useful when you have discrete behavior. When you are dealing with continuous behavior, you have to go to hybrid automata. You can use model checking and theorem proving both together. And then you, you need to have probabilistic and statistical model checking. So when you have things that are not certain, you need to enter probability. It will make life hard. Probability is always hard to deal with. And statistical model checking is, again, something that everyone is now working on in model checking. It's a kind of back to simulation because they couldn't handle the state explosion. And I listened to some of Clark's talks. Actually, this is what they have to do. They need to, uh, when, it's, when there is state explosion, we need to give up. But this is a nice way to tackle that. Uh, and then interpreting counterexamples, that's also important. We are not yet that good in interpreting our counterexamples. And we still need to scale up. Don't be happy, I'm not done. There are many slides yet there. So, why? because usually future work is the last slide. It's not. So why did I give this talk? So uh, what does it have to do with me model checking? Uh, as I told you, verification of software is uh, uh, one of the challenges of future and everything. So what we did, we said, OK, we are not going to start from software. We are not going to start from a program code. And this is, again, from Clark's uh, slides. We have so many problems with software, large unbounded base types, user-defined types, pointers, aliasing, procedure calls, concurrency, unbounded number of threads, templates, generics, include files, interrupts, blah, blah, blah. OK, we have many. So what we did was saying, OK, we are not going to use programs. We are not going to model check programs. We will use a model. In the US, people are not happy. People are not that much used to use models. So they want to start from programs. They are practical people. OK, I'm telling people I'm the majority or whatever. Don't take it literally, whatever I say. So. Uh, uh, they want to jump to the programs. But like in Germany, people are used to model. And I think we can trust German engineers, actually. History showed us that. So 
in software, we can also start from modeling instead of start and jump. And all, that's why engineers don't trust us, don't, don't like to call software engineers engineers because they think we are not using mathematics enough. So we have our own kind of mathematics. We start from models. We do model checking on the model, not on the software. So that's what I'm doing and I was trying to do and many others are trying to do. So, and that's what they did in hardware even. So they also started to abstract the level of, uh, the, uh, higher the level of abstraction in their design. If they do the model checking or if they are here, they have a huge state space. So they are also thinking of uh, formal verification of higher levels of design and they are going to use techniques from software verification. So uh, we are moving to the same uh, direction. And the other thing that I did was choosing a specific model of computation. So all these very nice research has been done in the level of the transition system. So all that I showed you and uh, Clark and many others, and David Clark's group, uh, if I remove the names, but on all those state reduction uh, challenges and achievements, they have been, most of them, they have been part of it. They are working on the level of transition system. So what we decided to do is that, okay, we will, we will focus on a specific domain, and we will try to use all these techniques and tricks for that specific domain. And that's how we can find our own tricks. So we are not at the level of the transition. So we have our approaches for compositional verification, property preserving abstraction, partial order symmetry, and we are doing all these things on the focused domain that we decided, which is actors, and they are actually event-driven asynchronous models and there can be used and because networking and uh, distributed concurrent programs are everywhere, this model of computation is not really a very narrow something special. This, is, this has been used in many places and these are the uh, examples of the applications we have worked on. Formal verification of system C which is a high level hardware design modeling verification and performance evaluation of network on chip, modeling verification and performance evaluation of wireless network application using tiny OS. So there are uh, a wide variety of applications that we can work on. And we also, uh, like Clark Group is focusing on statistical model checking, we are going a bit towards performance because when we look at these applications, we notice that people are really interested in optimization and performance, not only correctness. So it was really, yeah, it was a bit tight for us to stay in that when we were dealing with real uh, problems. So back to Edmund Clark, this is a talk about him. He got a 10 million NSF grant in 2009, so for five years, 2009 to 2014. Uh, so Carnegie Mellon leads a 10 million NSF initiative to develop modeling tools for disease and complex systems. This is the news and Edmund Clark is actually uh, the leader of the team. It was many universities and many famous people. Actually even Amir Pnoeli was in the team but he passed away. Uh, so. Uh, they were going to create revolutionary computational tools that will advance science on a broad array of fronts, from discovering new cancer treatments to designing safer aircraft. So you see, as I told you, they are promising more than just dealing with programs. This is models, all kind of models that, uh, yeah, you can, all kind of fields that you can model them using the transition systems. So this is what they are doing, computational modeling analysis for complex systems, next generation model checking and abstract interpretation with a focus on systems biology and embedded systems. So, and the vision is to gain fundamental new insights into the emergent behaviors of complex biological and embedded systems uh, through the use of revolutionary, highly scalable and fully automated modeling 
and analysis techniques. So yeah, you can see this is one example of embedded system in our cars and do you trust your car? Do you trust your car? Exactly, exactly. It doesn't have anything smart yet. Uh, aerospace systems, software driven, do we trust flight software? Yeah, we have UTE, we can trust it. So, uh, and then you see even cancer. I didn't copy many slides of that. I didn't understand much about what they're doing in that field, but they're doing a lot. So I know many people are doing in this, uh, yeah, biology and, but I don't understand anything about that. And I was Googling and Googling and Googling about Clark and he won even another, yet another award in December 2013. So he's going to get, how much was it? Some, 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 250,000 US dollars, yeah, you see? So come on, do some model checking. Uh, so we, he won this prize and this is a big one actually. Yeah, he, he's for his leading role in the conception and development of techniques for automatically verifying the correctness of a broad array of computer systems including those found in transportation, communication, and medicine. Did we? We did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, you're right. We did. Let me show these statistics. Okay. Don't spoil my, my story. Okay. So, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, so, and this is a very prestigious award. You see Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison, Albert Einstein and I don't know Jane Goodall. So they, they all got this award. So he's winning and winning and winning. So now that I'm talking about awards, I was looking at this Turing Award and who got it. And then I came to some statistics. It's very quick. I may have made some mistakes. But uh, yeah, it was 16 names. And it was from 1960, why didn't I write this down? It was from 1966 to 2012. I wrote it somewhere. Um, and from this 60 people, 40 of them are from the United States, six from UK, three from Israel, two from Canada. But actually the affiliation of people from Canada was again in the US, one from the Netherlands, with the affiliation inside the Netherlands, one from Switzerland, affiliation inside Switzerland, India, Venezuela, and China, all from the US, one from Norway, Denmark, and Fr France, and they're all inside their own countries, and Italy, which is again from MIT. So, whew, not, not many from non-American people, so guys, we have to do something, maybe. Uh, yeah, and as I told, I, I, I made this one blue because I noticed one of the Americans actually was working in Toronto. So although, you see, I didn't make this blue because they were in the U.S. This one is blue because I found someone, in uh, some U.S. citizen working in Toronto winning uh, an award. So Canada is blue. Uh, and there were 57 males and three females. And these are in 2006, 8 and 12, and all from the US, which is OK. I guess, what else can I say? But we are growing. So uh, yeah, this is all. If you have any questions about model checking, Edmund Clark, Turing Awards, $250,000. Mm -hmm. uh, do you use SAP formers in your work yet? No. Actually, we did that. We tried all these things. We, we, ch we mapped Rebecca to logic. And we, we did the exact same. We had steps, but we just didn't follow that project. 
But this is one of my previous students. He is not. He is now at Cornell. He was in EPFL. He was working on SAT solvers. And yeah, he says this is the future of model checking. Yeah. They are doing lots of work. And also Clark was saying this is something that is going fast. Okay. This, if they can really work, then model checking is amazing. You know, when I told you if we felt really tight, but that's what Clark is saying, and I was going through all his slides for his NSF grant. They moved towards statistical model checking, and he used the word I can't remember. It's actually against all his beliefs. You know, it's not proving anymore. It's just like simulation, but in a more systematic way. And that's because we got this state explosion, especially for these biological things. They couldn't manage. They couldn't build a state space. So if the sets always grow fast, then we can go back to model checking. I'm sorry if I bored you. I tried my best not to. But this is as much as model checking can be not boring. Yeah. I want to say that because of statistics, $250,000 price, that's why, you know, I know, just before uh, they had what is it? 2014. So, yeah, how much they achieved from what they promised in this NSF grant, uh, and actually the question is related to how much they achieved that they could win yet another one in 2014. Honestly, I don't know. So I tried to find out. Uh, I'm sure they couldn't cure cancer. That I'm sure. But yeah. yeah, they didn't promise. Yeah, they are having very good progress. But yeah, and it's it's growing actually. They are they're really <laughs> what? I'm sure they were paid for the project. It is. I I checked it. Yeah. I checked it. I not all of it, but. Yeah, their papers and the statistical model checking, probabilistic one, and all kind of biological things and automotive industry. But what concretely, what did they do? I don't know. I'm sure they're doing a good job. But I actually, I think the work of Kim Larson or the work of Crystal Bayer or all these probabilistic model checking guys, come on. We have so many, <laughs> so I, many. I think you should cut this. Uh, <laughs> we made it off for YouTube now. I don't want to get into trouble. <laughs>